We've gone through the encoding process of taking information in and establishing it as memory. So now what we'll be taking a look at is memory storage, or basically just the retention of information that's been encoded, that we've been presented with. Um, storage is at the heart of memory because if something isn't stored in our brains in order for us to be able to retrieve it later on, um, if there is something that occurred you know, within the encoding process and something isn't stored properly or something along those lines, obviously our ability to hold on to that piece of info or to recognize it later on is going to be significantly impaired. There are three stores of memory uh, shown below just here in this organizer. You have sensory memory, working memory, so referred to uh, in a sense as short-term memory, and then you have long-term memory. Much of what we're going to cover in today's video notes focuses in on long-term memory, but if you look at it, you know, you have an event or a situation or a piece of information that's presented to your sensory memory. It's perceived as being important, so it makes it through to working memory and short-term memory. Okay, and then it's encoded even further because we perceive it to have significance into our long-term memory. Once it's established in long-term memory, when we go about attempting to need to use that information later on, it's retrieved through our working memory, and then it's able to be pulled up and uh, enables us to be able to use it as a result. So as I said, long-term memory is going to be the focus of our set of notes for this particular part of storage. Long-term memory has unlimited capacity within it. Okay, so they've you know they've done estimates on this, and don't ask me how they decided they wanted to study this, but they determined that our capacity within our long-term memory ranges from a thousand billion to one million billion pieces of information. That, that, that's a lot. That's a large number of zeros, and that's a large number of things and items and experiences and events and people that we can interact with over our lifetime. There is a story of a man named Rajan Mahadevan, and he actually was able to recite the first 31,811 digits of pi. Okay, um, we're most of us are familiar with it as 3.14. Um, but it's that ratio between the diameter and the circumference of a circle. And so he uh, was able to remember 31,811 digits of that, all stored in his long-term memory. Okay, so we really do have this unbelievable capacity within that part of our brains. And so really what we've got to ask ourselves is then, you know, the key component in question to what we're going to cover where storage is concerned is where is memory stored? We know that for the most part there is a large portion that is stored in our temporal lobe. Okay, We know this from the uh, studies of Wilder Penfield back in 1967. Through electrical stimulation of the brain there were some older memories that were still etched in those areas and so they determined that the temporal lobe is a storehouse for memory. Now Elizabeth Loftus ended up in 1980 going back and looking over that data and she ended up looking and trying to retest it and she found that only a handful of patients whose brains were stimulated reported flashbacks. And so what she argued then as a result of that was that it's not just one place, it's all over the brain and it basically gets to the point of, you know, we, we are able to remember where something is or how it happens or who people are, not necessarily because there's a physical spot only in one part of the brain, but really our storage happens where the information is processed. So for example, if something is highly emotional, it's going to go through the amygdala, for example. Okay. Now Lashley also ended up studying a great deal with memory as well. What he did was he basically lesioned uh, parts of the brains of rats and then put them back into a maze, okay, and they were still able to retain partial amounts of how to get through it. And so he, in addition to Penfield and Loftus, ended up arguing that there are several different spots in the brain that control or are storehouses of memories and experiences that we go through. One theory of how that information is physiologically stored in the brain is the issue of memory trace. Okay, They are searching, if you are of the memory trace field, for something called an engram. Okay, It's this biological basis of 
uh, long-term memory, basically how it is established into the brain physically through neurons and synapses and things like that. So what they do is they look at something called long-term potentiation that occurs in synapses. They look at the level of synapses and biochemical changes that happen and they believe that those changes in neural pathways and connections are the physical trace of a memory being present in those nerve cells. And so they also look for something called neural circuitry, and they use that to kind of go about attempting to establish that our memory storage is in fact a physiological process, okay? It is physically stored in our brains. Okay, so let's talk about this whole concept of, of neural circuitry. At the basic heart of this is the concept of long-term potentiation. This deals with changes to the function or the structure of synapses in the, you know, those spaces in between neurons and in nerve cells in a general sense, okay? Changes to synapses cause uh, us to form memories physically in our brains, okay? they increase the efficiency of our synapses. So when you think about it, the first time that you go through and you learn something, it's a little shaky, you're uncertain, but the more that you repeat it, the faster you get, the better you get, the more efficient you become. They believe that the reason why that is the case, because you've established that memory um, to be able to just turn something that was at once effortful process processing into something that becomes more automatic processing is because of long-term potentiation. The synapses in your brain, what happened to them was they helped to create a neural network. The more that we do something, the more efficient the synapses become at sending out more information to establish those neural pathways. So they release neurotransmitters faster and they send the messages quicker. Another really good way to kind of think of this for yourself as an analogy to help you better understand LTP, because you can see the visual here, this is the synapse. The first time something happened, uh, you know, the, the neurotransmitters are released relatively slowly, but as you go through an action and you carry out more and more and more, you become more efficient at it because the synapse is sending out the neurotransmitter even more quickly to help you get through that process more efficiently. Think of things in this regard as kind of like a cornfield. The first time you run your way through a cornfield, there's not a whole lot of trace left of you and your path in that cornfield. There's a little bit one. There's slight in terms of the amount of um, memory, so to speak, that you've left there. But the more that you run through that path, the more that you, you know, walk over it, lay the path, so to speak, and make it more permanent, the more noticeable it becomes until it is a physical permanent example of a pathway that you've established. So that's a great way to kind of think of, uh, you know, an analogy for neural circuitry, okay? Originally when they started to try to study this stuff, they looked at botched operations, specifically where brains were concerned, okay? They wanted to see how people could function after messed up brain uh, lesioning surgeries, okay? So there was this, so there was this particular patient, HM, who had epileptic seizures. They had very, very strong difficulties with being able to control. So his hippocampus and his amygdala on both sides of the brain were removed. He had no hippocampus, no amygdala. Since that surgery in 1953, HM has been completely unable to store new memories of the events in his life. Okay, so we know then that the hippocampus is involved in processing new memories. However, we also know that HM had memories from before the operation that remained normal and intact. So some other part of the brain had to be the storehouse for those older memories. And so that's what really was the kind of touching off point to studying neural circuitry and that physiological pathway of creating neural networks in our brain. So when we're talking about the fact that the brain stores memories in different areas, not just one particular spot like the temporal lobe, for example it's important that we got to look at what those brain structures are. So in your prefrontal cortex, right up here, this is memory that helps us where sequential events are happening. Okay, so you know, seeing things in a step-by-step -step process, putting them in proper order based on time or things along those lines, um, but not necessarily the events themselves. It's purely just how they go in order, okay? Putting things in, in the proper structure. 
Where the amygdala is concerned, this is going to deal with the emotional aspects of memories because the amygdala is so closely involved in our experiences of emotion. Your temporal lobe, specifically the medial temporal lobe, it's not visible, okay? It is going to take in information, it encodes it, and it transfers it into what we refer to as explicit memory. I'm going to talk about what those are in a second. And it goes from those explicit memories to long-term memories, okay? Your hippocampus helps to translate and encode information and store it as new explicit memory. And then your cerebellum helps with movement, okay, remembering how to carry out various different movements. So, for example, remembering how to ride a bike or how to do a backflip. That muscle movement memory is involved in cerebellum functioning. So, one more time. The big key components, hippocampus, it, en it enables us to have an initial encoding process of information. Our cerebral cortex right up here, that major decision-making, higher level thought processing, helps us to change these new experiences into relatively permanent memories. Amygdalas help us to strengthen memories that have emotional associations to them. And then these emotions help to kind of act as retrieval methods as well. When we move into retrieval of memory a little bit later on, we're going to talk about how we are able to pull up certain experiences that have been stored in our long-term memories more so just because of the emotional experiences that are attached to them. Interestingly enough, we also believe that the amygdala is particularly heavily involved in post-traumatic stress disorder and the persistent and kind of troubling memories that are attached with that, those flashbacks that are so traumatic for people that have PTSD. They do believe that the amygdala is fairly heavily involved in that particular type of disorder. So, the big key takeaway to discern from all of this is that memories don't exist in just one spot of your brain. LTP, long-term potentiation, enables us to establish those neural pathways, think back to that cornfield, but those neural pathways happen all over the brain, particularly when it comes to the specific information that's being processed, okay? So where that processing happens, that is where the memory is going to be stored. So for example, the cerebellum and muscle movement, muscle memory, that's going to be located there because it's processed there. The neural pathways are formed in the cerebellum, okay? Visual information, that's going to be processed and stored in the visual cortex of the occipital lobe because that's where its function is primarily. So that's what we mean when we're talking about that.